Today we'll be peering into the oily black wriggling mass that is Mortal Shell's lore. This video will be focused on Solomon the Scholar, but if there's interest I'll do some videos on the other characters and religions. For a warning, I am only going to be using the lore from the main game, which is significantly altered from the beta. I'll explain a little bit later. So let's begin. The format of this video will be using the dialogue from the skill unlocks and tying them into the inscriptions and etchings that I think are most relevant to Solomon's story. So let's start with his namesake. Huh. Existence is a curious matter. The greatest triumph in the universe, gifted and squandered. I shan't make the same mistakes as my brother. When the moment comes, I'll exercise restraint. So, with each character, I think the most important line of dialogue is going to be the first one that we are exposed to. From this line of dialogue alone, we know that Solomon has a brother, and Solomon's brother makes a choice that Solomon is going to avoid. Let's continue. The faces of infinity are etched in stone, stacked in endless columns. Careful now. The precarious weight of such knowledge could crush an unwise man if he were to pluck a tablet in haste. It would be laughable if it were not so lamentable. These so-called seers wield icons and contraptions that they do not understand. They uphold laws they ignore as needed. And yet, they unearth the tablet like nothing I'd seen before. Is this what you found? The promise of the unknowable? It's gibberish. Familiar signs and symbols etched by a human hand in my own tongue. Yet they're arranged without any discernible logic. The letters spiral in concentric circles, interspersed with figures that resemble mathematical formulae. It means nothing, I'm certain. But I can't look away. So that entire monologue is the result of unlocking three different skills. The accretion of ascent, the recollection of knowledge, and the accretion of inheritance. The key theme here is Solomon says these so-called seers found a tablet that promises the unknowable, but upon reading it, it's gibberish. There's no discernible logic even though he acknowledges that it's in his own tongue. He says, it means nothing, but I'm not so certain. How could this be a story of a man with my name? He bears the same scars, shares in the same desires, even finds the same tablet. Can it be called a history if it's written by a being that sees the future as readily as the past? In the accretion of knowledge, Solomon references the promise of the unknowable. What is more unknowable than the future? While you might be sure that you will be going to the park tomorrow, you will never truly know. You could get into a car accident on the way. The sun could explode. Your foresight is ultimately clouded by an infinite set of possibilities before you. In the accretion of foresight, Solomon is coming to terms with the tablet's contents He's realizing that his own future is literally set in stone before him. He's incredulous that he is ultimately reading his own story, even about how he finds the tablet. Foresight is ultimately what sets Solomon apart from the other shells. He is literally capable of reading the future, and it suits his name. In the real world, or in our own world's lore, I should say, Solomon is a very powerful name. To the occult, Solomon was a wizard, known for his godlike supernatural wisdom, far surpassing the wisdom of any other man. Although there are biblical interpretations of the historical figure Solomon, 
I'm utilizing the incult interpretation because I think it's fitting for the narrative of the game. The Clavicula Solomonis Regis is a real-world spellbook, also known as the Lesser Key of Solomon, which details how to make a tablet in order to talk to the gods, as well as detailing prayers that grant photographic memory. This completely aligns with Solomon's gameplay style, considering he has the highest resolve and is thus able to conjure the most spells. Vision is a burden, my dear brother. I do not blame you for leaving this empire of sycophants and charlatans behind. I fear our knowledge is only a privilege afforded by our silence. Each discovery only provides our masters with more chains. Fate is not ours to defy, only to fulfill. You're chosen, as am I, brother. As is the unborn, ordained by the infinite. Perhaps you'll understand one day. In death, I shall find a new purpose. And your purpose, twisted and malevolent as you are, will light the way. As I said when I first talked about Solomon's introduction, his brother was very important to his story. In a cave where you first find Solomon, if you strike the wall nearby, you will find a secret etching. And what of my kin? Are you reading this, dear brother? Do you still remember how we played at scholarship? Simpler times, when our quandaries were mere dramatics, dressed up as theory. From this, we learned two things. Solomon's brother was a scholar, just like him. And Solomon and his brother are fighting. But who is his brother? You. Should be dead. Solomon. No, it can't be. Oh. I see it's only his face and his form stretched across your frame. Of course, your silence gives it away. He always had too much to say. Babbling on and on. Incessantly, his words wound into such impossible, staggering formations, often contradicting himself beautifully. I do miss him. Unfortunately, my dear brother, spent too much time beneath those infinite golems. He promised to turn Tar into true nectar, and he succeeded. I witnessed the world birthed from the fires of heaven. I watched as it decayed into this wretched place. Such a gift. But when the vision ended, he stared at me with revulsion. I know you are awaiting my assailant. I have read how you will descend upon me. I will be too slow to stop you, though I will try. Just know that I do not blame you. I cannot hold on to this body when another will need it far more. We are a single existence, split only by the tides of time, joined together 
in death. You warned me not to go, as if you knew what I would find among the multitudes. But if that were true, why bother with such a useless gesture? Is it our nature to bemoan the unchanging course of fate? I stood before you, dear brother, watching in horror as your lips parted for that poison chalice. I followed a path once trod by those who would become sisters and brothers, watching the past and present converge. You did not know I was there. I looked on from another place, waiting to be born. We now know that the old prisoner is Solomon's brother, but what do we know about their relationship? We know Solomon looked at him with revulsion. This is because Solomon, in a vision, foretold the old prisoner's betrayal towards the end of the game. We also know he witnessed the old prisoner drink a poisoned chalice. Could this poisoned chalice contain the tar Solomon purportedly turned into true nectar? The old prisoner explains what he saw upon drinking from the chalice. I witnessed the world birthed from the fires of heaven. I watched as it decayed into the wretched place. He feels as if he was close to ascension, but this ascension was ultimately foiled as the cold, wretched reality reformed, and thus explains his motivations for collecting the glands. It is also my belief that the old prisoner is Solomon's assailant. In the accretion of dominance, Solomon states, In death I shall find a new purpose, and your purpose, twisted and malevolent as you are, will light the way. The old prisoner will light the way for his brother's death, and also for the ultimate ascension of the foundling. This ties into the recollection of death, where Solomon is addressing his assailant directly. We are a single existence, split only by the tides of time, joined together in death. This also carries a dual meaning. Solomon is talking about the literal joining in death of the foundling, using his body for a greater purpose, but also addressing his assailant, stating that the old prisoner will ultimately fail and die just as the brother he killed. Despite welcoming death, in the accretion of yearning, Solomon states, You warned me not to go, as if you knew what I would find among the multitudes. But if that were true, why bother with such a useless gesture? Solomon calls his murder a useless gesture because he acknowledges that fate is unstoppable. Perhaps the biggest giveaway that this is about his death is the mention of multitudes. Multitudes is a reoccurring word throughout the game. A dictionary definition for the word multitude is the mass of ordinary people without power or influence. When looking at the description for the glimpse of truth, it states, Grasped within the glimpse, there are multitudes, their bodies thread together, forming a single, indivisible being without a name. This nameless, formless creature speaks in all tongues, it speaks the bearer's name, it is burgeoning and unraveling it all at once. The vision grants more questions than answers. So, because Solomon can see the future, he recognizes that his death is what sets in motion the foundling's ability to ascend, to achieve a goal greater than he ever could. This dialogue also suggests that his murderer might have had suspicions, which is why he warned Solomon not to go. Thus, the murdering of his brother is ultimately what begins his downfall. It's all wrong. The visions have dissolved into darkness. There is no ascension.
So previously I had mentioned how I would only be using lore contained within the game as it had significantly changed from the beta. So let me finally explain. I don't know why, but there's a few examples of Solomon's lore from the beta that really just don't fit in. I'll put them on the screen now. Basically, there's an etching and an inscription called Solomon's Plan. And they just kind of contradict what the current lore is. I don't know if they were put in the beta to throw people off. It doesn't seem like they're accessible anywhere in the game. In fact, it took a lot of digging to even find these. So, um, yeah, I, I just chose to ignore them for the sake of this video. If anyone can find them in the game, then just let me know. Anyway, thanks for watching. I tried to keep this quick. There's obviously a lot to talk about this game. Uh, if this gets enough attention, I may do other characters, but this was a lot of effort to put together. There's not a lot of resources yet for this game, so it's a really exciting time to theorize. Um, if your theory is different from mine, please write in the comments below how. I'm really interested to hear other theories. I personally liked how they chose to write Solomon's dialogue. He had a very cyclical way of talking. So, yeah. Anyway, peace.